I'm Nick Penrake, author of The Internet Date, my fourth novel, which is published by Melange Books on Valentine's Day 2013. Now, in this short video, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the book, introduce the characters, the themes, that kind of thing, and read a short extract so that you have something to go on just in case you want to get a copy for yourself. Let me start off by saying what this is not. It's not, um, let's say, chick lit. It's not a how-to on internet dating. It's not a confessional with episodes of sexual encounters one after the next through the internet, although there is quite a bit of sex in this book. But it's not those things. The internet date, it is singular, so it is about this one inciting moment, this catalyst, if you will, in sort of writer's terms, that kicks off the action. And where we are, we're in London, 2009 and we're looking at the lives of five characters who work in media and men and women and we're looking at how dating affects their lives and in this case how one kind of sensational hilarious date in particular affects the lives of these five characters. So let me start introducing the characters. Brad and Miles, the two guys working in advertising. Brad is the younger one, he's mid-30s. He's sort of more client-facing. He's very mercurial, uh, just amazing wit, and yet he's somewhat flawed. He's developing a serious alcohol problem. Uh, he's teamed up with Miles, a copywriter, and they've set up, Miles is in his early 40s, and they've set up their own small agency in Soho, London. And they kind of picked a worse time to set up an agency because here we are in the recession, 2008, 2009, and they're struggling. And as a sort of antidote to all that kind of anxiety about their work life, they go out and have fun, and they've noticed that they have this sort of chemistry together. And I don't mean gay chemistry. It's, it's something about the way they are together that quickly breaks the ice when they, they're out and they meet women. And they've noticed how one, you know, when they're together that they have more success. And so they, because they're now both dating, they get it, they have this idea, why, why don't we um, do this together? So the way they do it is this. One guy will go out with a girl, it'll be his date, and the friend turns up maybe half an hour into the date and pretends to meet his friend by chance and so, and so on, and he breaks the ice, and as a result of that, the date tends to go that much better. Sometimes it, it ends up in bed, sometimes it doesn't. But either way, they have fun doing it, and it's a way of sort of not taking the dating thing too seriously because they have the fun, and it doesn't really matter too much, the outcome. But then along comes Gina. Gina's 34, attractive, Anglo-Italian woman, she works as a yoga teacher and she teaches English to foreign students. And in her spare time, she's writing scripts and trying to break into TV and film. She meets Mars. It's Mars's turn, if you will. And they go on really well. They have things in common. They like each other. And Brad turns up according to the plan. And Brad should be just sticking around for a few minutes, but he sticks around a lot longer. And not only that, but Miles quickly picks up the sense that Brad is making a play for Gina. That's just breaking the rules. And then when Gina takes them on to a hotel bar later in the evening, uh, she goes to a place where one of her students, Javier, is a waiter. And she seems to have a little bit of a thing with him. Uh, and clearly he's attracted to her. So we've got this going on at the same time as this kind of bickering thing between Brad and Miles. And in fact, Brad and Miles go off to the toilets to try and sort out their differences. And Miles says, look, hey, this is my date. And Brad says, no, I don't care whether it's your date or not. I know there's a special chemistry between me and Gina. So they fight over it, literally fight over it. And when they return to the bar area where Gina is waiting for them to you know, come back, what the hell are they doing? She starts to pick up this tension between the two guys and starts to think, something, they're playing some sort of game with me. And 
she then turns the tables on them and plays a game of her own. And it, the whole evening ends in this one big, hilarious, bloody mess. Um, and as a result of that explosive internet date, lives are affected. Clearly the three lives and the people they are closely connected to. So that's, if you will, the setup, and and that's why I call it the internet date. Rather like if you think, if you know The, the Slap is an Australian novel and it was made into a TV series, there's one inciting moment. That a man slaps a boy, and as a result of that, friends and family fall out, and you know the, the whole ethical question, can you slap a boy, when can you slap a boy, and so on, is the big question in the book. Well, I'm not raising a question quite the same way with the internet date, but it does charge the action. And as a result of that one date, these lives are affected. So that's the setup of the internet date. In fact, it was uh, based on a play which I wrote, produced and directed back in 2009, right just as the recession was, was kicking in really. And people came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I really enjoyed it. And you know what, you should make this into a TV script or a play, uh, not a, a TV play or a, a, a film script. And I actually set out to write it as a film script. It seemed the logical thing to do, go from theatre to a film. But I found that I wanted to go deeper with the characters and actually as I structured the novel, I found that I now have better source material for the film script, which is interesting. But so that, that's the origins of the book and that's why a lot of you who get to read it uh, will find it's, it's very dynamic. So the dialogue's working fast and hard and it, it, it's a page turn just, just from the dialogue. You, you'll really get into the, the way people talk and the, the kind of vernacular of dating and people in the media who are you know, trying to juggle too many things in their lives. In fact, the internet date in many ways is it's kind of, got the two, you've got two themes here. You've got the dating theme and how we relate, and underneath that, uh, there's the, the, the territory or, or, or the, the, the space we're in right now with the, the recession, the insecurity about our jobs, the insecurity, you know, we've got to work longer hours for pay that is the same we were earning six years ago, but rent and mortgage, they're all higher. You know, we're all feeling much more insecure and therefore restless, and the internet, so that kind of exacerbates that because we can we feel that we're much more mobile, but at the same time we realise that because we are much more mobile, we can be dropped just as quickly as we pick things up, uh, and that's what I'm looking at in the internet day. As, as you know, how do we how do we get beyond transience? How do we get beyond just kind of having fun to something more lasting? And in the internet day. This is what happens, that people make choices and that because they're restless, they think they can have this and then something else. And, and of course, at some point, you, you, you're gonna come off the road because um, you can't keep juggling things without sooner or later dropping the ball. And in this story, when one guy takes on too much in terms of relationships, and that's Brad, he causes serious damage which uh, ends tragically. So in many ways, although there are many funny moments in, in the story, it's, it's kind of a tragic comedy, really. Um, it, it, there, there is this dark side, this almost element of thriller, noirish sort of feel to the novel, which, uh, you know, if you like noir, if you like something a little bit darker and relationships where people actually talk about sex and, and not in that sort of embarrassed way, but actually you know, something more meaningful, then I think you'll really get a lot out of this novel. Anyway, I'm going to read you an extract and uh, give you a flavour of the writing and, and, and uh, you know, maybe it's enough for you to go buy a copy for yourself. At this point, Brad and Miles are on this date with Gina. They've gone to the hotel bar and they can't agree on whose date this is. It should be Mars' date, but Brad's been sticking around. And now they've gone off to the gents to work things out. Who's going to stay and who's going to leave? So, Brad led Mars to the toilets where they could talk. And sure enough, Brad had been calling his dealer. 
Worse still, he wanted to go on to a party with Gina, and preferably without Miles. Brad, what the fuck? Miles began. You can't do that. That's not how this goes. You agreed that this date was mine. So if anyone should leave, it's you. Miles, Miles, listen to me. It's me she wants. How can you be so bloody arrogant? I just know. Bollocks. It's true, he insisted, mock pleading to a sad, deluded friend to return to reason. How do you know she doesn't like me? I didn't say she didn't like you. I just know you're not suited together. I, I just know. Brad's pious expression of inevitability brought Miles to the brink of violence. Oh, you just know. Well, that's all right then. I do, yes. I told you. We met before. Yeah, like five minutes, apparently. It doesn't matter. We had this connection and I, I can feel it now. You just have to accept that. I have to accept it. What the fuck are you going on about? Please just go. No. Why do you have to be so stubborn? I'm besotted with her. This is something bigger, Miles, not just a shag. You couldn't possibly have fallen in love with her in just a few hours. But I did. I have. Bollocks. She's gorgeous. Listen to him. Miles threw out his hand as if to an imaginary audience, only to run into his tired and defeated reflection in the basin mirrors. That's what you said the last time we went on one of these internet dates. When it was my turn, if memory serves. Turn? It was no one's turn. Don't be so petty and mean. We agreed. No, we didn't. There's never been an agreement like in a contract. You have to be more flexible, Miles. What you really mean is, I have to defer every time to your wanton selfishness. We had an arrangement, Brad. Yes, OK, but it's never been anything formal, Miles. Why are you being so rigid about it? Because it, <laughs> if we're not fair, it won't work. There will be others, Miles. You've done this twice already. What do you think I am, your fucking doormat? Brad's jaw dropped as if he were deeply affronted. I mean, where's the incentive for me to play along if you always get the prettier girls? Because you feel something. Jesus Christ. Please go, Brad, repeated, lowering his chin, like a sensible teacher graciously suppressing his righteous temper. Here's an idea. You go. Brad stared at him for a moment. Miles felt a terrible pang of regret in his chest that he wanted to kill Brad at this moment. Then Brad began pushing him. No more words, just pushing him. Oi! Miles shouted and pushed back. It was like being in the schoolyard again, or school toilets. He tried to block Brad's thrusting arms, but Brad accelerated his pushing. Miles pushed back harder, shoving Brad back toward the urinals, until his rhythm was suddenly broken by a sharp whack on his nose. He stopped dead in his tracks. He brought his fingers to his nose and fell wet. And yes, he was bleeding. You fucking asshole! Miles spat it as he swung at Brad with his foot. It was years since he'd done any kung fu, but the arch of his foot easily found the soft side of Brad's knee and Brad went down, throwing out a hand to grab the basin to save his skull from the floor. What is your problem? Mars exclaimed and headed to the basin farthest from Brad, head jutting out in order to save his clothes from a rivulet of blood. Brad slowly pulled himself upright, rubbing his sore knee. Why are you being so stubborn? Mars whacked on the cold water tap. You know what, Brad? I can't help noticing you use that word a lot when you don't get your own way with me. But you are. Miles dabbed his nose. At least it wasn't broken. A long House of Windsor nose. That just might not survive the indignity of a break. How about we just forget this whole idea of going on dates together, huh? If you can't play fair, forget it. The cold water was calming his temper. He kept dabbing his nose. I thought you'd be reasonable and just get it, Brad insisted. I would certainly leave if I thought she was right for you. But she isn't. I'm sorry, you can't see that. You're sorry, Miles echoed derisively. He was about to add more when a man in a raincoat entered. He glanced furtively at the pair of them, then disappeared into a cubicle and bolted the door with gratuitous violence. Miles grabbed a couple of paper towels from the dispenser and swept himself from the room. You can read what happens next by getting your own copy. Thanks for being here.